I work for the Framingham Board of Health. I'm a member of the Holliston Board of Health. It's um, secondhand smoke, uh, causes cardiovascular disease, it causes various kinds of cancer. I thought it was flawed, I thought it was biased, and it contradicted studies that have been put out by the Boston University School of Public Health. I, when I reviewed the, the Massachusetts Restaurant Association study, I found that there were several uh, important flaws in, in that study. About the restaurant jobs, um, it looked at total number of jobs. It didn't look at hours. So that if you had two part-time jobs that were made into a full-time job, it counts that as the loss of a job. Many of these ordinances wasn't the proper time frame. Um, some of the laws had gone into effect uh, after the point at which they ended the analysis. And in fact, some of them had not yet gone into effect at the time before they uh, started the analysis. Studies have shown that businesses didn't decline, that businesses didn't go out of business in Brookline. As a matter of fact, there are more food service establishments in Brookline now than when the um, bylaw went into effect. I know that um, in Holliston, the Restaurant Association gave us a list of restaurants that have gone out of business or lost business. Well, some of them were in Framingham, and I knew that the whole um, corporate they went out of business. You know, like they gave a list and they said, cappuccinos went out of business in Brookline. There aren't any cappuccinos. They all went out of business. It had nothing to do with the smoking ban. I thought it was flawed. I thought it was biased. And it contradicted studies that have been put out by the Boston University School of Public Health. There has been a lot of uh, discussion about the, the possibility that when communities go smoke free and eliminate smoking in restaurants and bars that they may lose business and when these ordinances are debated at the community level a lot of times the restaurant owners or bar owners um, will express concern you know we're going to lose all our business people are going to leave town and and go eat elsewhere if you ban smoking and it was a hypothetical statewide ban on smoking so if, if smoking were eliminated in all restaurants in Massachusetts uh, how would that affect your, your dining behavior? And basically the conclusion of the study was that a statewide law that eliminated smoking in, in bars and restaurants would have no significant impact on uh, restaurant and bar business. Yeah, they showed a decrease of 10% when it first took effect and then slowly came back over about six to eight months it came back. But we still lose some, some, some want some just want a smoking section. In fact, we estimated that it might actually increase business because we identified a large proportion of the population who said that they avoid going to bars and restaurants because of the smoke. January 1st. Um, the first was a Saturday, so we had to do it on a Monday. It was the first day. For us, it's an advantage because we have more non-smokers. We have a lot of families that come in here. Um, there was always a huge wait upstairs, you know. We, we crank in the kitchen, we try to get you guys in and out as fast as possible, but um, nobody wanted to sit down here. We just redid it, which is gonna help. And um, people didn't want to sit down in the smoker. It's a drab room. A lot of the uh, older clientele love it. They say, no, all non smoking great. That's the way we want it. I don't know. It was just, it's a better thing for us. You know, we're not a, we're not, booze isn't our thing. You know, food is number one here, and then, you know, if we can get some liquor sales, then it helps. But food is how we make our money. Uh, as a manager, we like it. It's easier to maintain our restaurant. We uh, don't have the problems of repainting all the time, uh, cleaning, you know, the ashes, the, the smoke itself. The main reason why it's much easier to pass these smoke-free laws on a local level than at the state or national level, is that the tobacco industry has a much stronger influence at the state level and certainly at the national level. It's a lot harder for the tobacco industry to influence local city councils, although they certainly have attempted to do it and in some cases have been successful. But when you're dealing with a local city council, um, generally it's a lot harder for the tobacco industry to exert an influence and to directly lobby those council members. At the state level, and certainly in Congress, it's a lot easier for the tobacco industry to have an influence. The industry has, hires a large number of lobbyists 
uh, at state legislatures and certainly at, in Congress. And, and the tobacco industry also makes contributions, campaign contributions, to uh, congressmen at the, at the national level. And so the, it's a lot easier for them to exert an influence on the policymaking process. It's not so easy for them to do that at the local level. And I think that's why we've had a lot more, there has been a lot more success at the local level with these laws. It covers food service establishments in the town, and it divides them by in, in three different categories. The first category are restaurants that have no bar. Restaurants without a liquor license have to be 100% smoke-free. Like Friendly's, McDonald's, um, most of the Papaginos. Okay, okay and those are 100% smoke-free. Then the category that kind of straddles are restaurants with liquor licenses. In the bar area, you can't have more than 25% of the seating for the entire establishment. You also can't have minors in that section and food has to be incidental to the serving of alcohol so that, in effect, it's not the smoking section of a restaurant. It's really the bar area. And then the third category are bars, and those are places where they don't really serve food, and those can allow smoking in 50% of the seating, but you don't need to have a physical barrier, and no minors don't realize how smoking and drinking go hand in hand. You know, you had a lot of people, I mean, some restaurants stayed smoking, so it was easier for them, you know, but we had to go non-smoking. It was hard. We had a whole section that was smoking that had to go non-smoking. The bar, it's awfully hard to have, you know, have bar guests in here, and you have to say, I'm sorry, you can't smoke. You know, but for that fact, it did go down a lot. I would say a large part of your, of your tavern crowd is smoking, sure. But since we've been smoking now, it's been unbelievable. And I've had guests say to me, or they've come in and they've seen the new smoking, they've seen the enclosure, yeah. and they've asked about it, and I say, oh, that's for the smokers, and they say, oh, good. Like it, the bar looks wonderful now. It totally separates from everything. It's a new world. It's a different world in here. Yeah. You know, you don't really hear anything out there. You know, people in here, this is the bar. Out there is the restaurant, so. Say, we feel it benefits smokers and non-smokers alike. And, um, I've had a lot of positive feedback, especially from the non-smokers, yeah. yeah. Several owners of restaurants in town uh, contacted me through the Chamber of Commerce and uh, wanted me to uh, uh, give them an estimate, an estimated cost as to what it would take to bring their buildings up to the proposed uh, regulations that the Board of Health was, was trying to uh, uh, bring into into law. They were trying to be sensitive to uh, you know to the non-smoker, and uh, most of the restaurants uh, were able to you know to segregate a smoking area and a non-smoking area. Um, where they were f falling short was the smoke would drift into the non-smoking area, or a non-smoker would have to walk through the smoking area to use the toilet facilities, things like that. We were coming up with estimates for the mechanical equipment of, uh, I believe, anywhere from like $18,000 up to, you know, $75,000, $100,000, maybe even more. Uh, Clyde's at, uh, was the name of it at the time. Uh, that wasn't quite so simple. Uh, you know, again, this non-smoker had to walk through the smoking area in order to get to the restrooms. Um, but he didn't have any exhaust equipment to move the air uh, away from that, uh, that circulation area. Um, in order for him to solve the problem, he would have had to put up a petition and, you know, probably a glass petition so that, you know, the people don't feel segregated from each other and also install some, uh, you know, sophisticated exhaust uh, equipment. Uh, the Silver Lounge restaurant, uh, they, they had, you know, some problems there, too. We had to walk through the, uh, uh, the smoking area to get to the restrooms. And uh, that, um, that was, that, well, actually, that wasn't so bad because uh, the lounge area was the area, was the smoking area. The dining area uh, was the, the non-smoking area, and that's where the toilets were. So. The people in the dining room could get back and forth to the you know toilet rooms without having to walk through 
uh, the, um, uh, the the smoking lounge, with the exception of the, they have a caboose on one end of the of the building over there where they uh, they have tables set up in there, and and that's a non-smoking area. So those people would have to walk through the smoking area. Uh, the Nimrod uh, restaurant, for one, uh, was was difficult in as much as you had to walk from the dining room through the lounge, which was the smoking area, to get to the restrooms. However, the owner uh, had already installed a, an exhaust system right over the bar area. I thought that I'd uh, put my money where my mouth is and voluntarily ventilate and set an example of what uh, businesses can and would do if uh, left to govern themselves. When the town did that, passed their smoking laws, their anti-smoking laws, um, they wanted everyone, the restaurants who were going to continue to, to ha provide a smoking area, to submit engineered stamped plans of the systems they plan to install. And uh, you know, the fellow that operates the place uh, had put in a system on his own that was actually, you know, working. It didn't make a lot of sense in that um, here we were, a restaurant that had been ventilated for secondhand smoke for two years previous and still were um, ventilated. Um, and because we didn't have the engineer's stamp, they wanted to shut us down. So that seemed to be working, but it didn't conform to these standards that were being set up. So, you know, the point we were trying to make is here's a fairly inexpensive solution that, that did really solve you know, the problem for the most part without conforming to these regulations. Uh, here was a case where you could walk through a smoking area, but yet the way this, the floor plan was set up and the way he had his exhaust system set up, the smoke was being drawn away from that circulation path, you know. The reason why these predictions are wrong is that I really don't think that people go to bars and restaurants specifically to smoke. I think people go to restaurants to eat, and I think people go to bars to, to dine and to have, to drink and to socialize. And I think that most smokers will be considerate enough uh, that if smoking is not allowed in a facility, that they will, if they need to smoke, they will simply step outside and, and have a smoke, or they'll hold off for a while. and. I think that there's also a large market of non-smokers who are avoiding going to these places because of the smoke. And so I think what happens when you eliminate smoking in, in these facilities is that perhaps you might lose a few smokers, but you'll probably bring in just as many non-smokers uh, who will start going if uh, they can dine and enjoy their food and drink without having to breathe in the, the carcinogens. Limiting the sizes, so over the last five or six years before that, they started limiting the space where you could smoke, and then it went into effect January 1st, total ban. Lounges, there was absolutely no smoking anywhere in the building or the grounds. That dropped my business 40% on January 1st. 40% drop was all those regular customers that just never came back because they couldn't smoke there. And they told us they weren't coming back, so there's not much you could do. Oh. One, of the, one of the biggest things, the misconception is that there's only 25% of the people smoke, so that's only 25%, but most married couples or people that go out will accommodate a smoker at this point. So they'll only go to a restaurant where that person can smoke. And it's kind of funny, so if, if a married couple and only 25% of the people, that means 50% of the couples statistically won't come to your restaurant. And probably 90% of the drinking business is, is smoke related. There's very little uh, non-smoking bars in the world today. We didn't, we didn't gain any non-smokers because they already were coming in. They already had the place. They didn't have a, um, a disadvantage or by, by having a non-smoking se section that was adjacent to a smoking section. So to them, it, there was no difference in one way or the other. So we picked up zero business. We just lost all our smoking business. But it took such a dramatic, we, we, we lost money in right away. And there wasn't much to, we tried different programs. We knew it was coming in, 
So we put out a lot of coupons January 1st and did a lot of advertising just to try and catch a new base in it. So not only did we heavily advertise, we went down 40% even with the extra advertising. So that was uh, very difficult. And um, the big thing that people don't realize is there were a lot of families that their income was affected. They've been with me for a long time. And not only did I lose money, but they lost money too. They weren't able to support their families. So. For the band, I had 62. And down towards the end, I was down to like 18 at the end. And uh, pretty much they just went to the other restaurants that had the business. And a new restaurant took over. It opened about a week ago. And um, oh, that'll be a different, you know, different, total different uh, situation because you're building a new business from scratch and developing customers that are already non-smoking, opposed to having a certain clientele. And then you just eliminate that clientele completely. So um, you don't get that grace period anymore. You don't get that back once you've been open for a while. People don't come out and try you again just because you stopped non-smoking, went to non-smoking. And that's the problem with the non-smoking laws. Instead of a, a statewide ban, it created a, a monopoly, per se, for the restaurants that could still offer smoking. And uh, we, we weren't able to uh, really counteract that at all. And we lost a lot of business because of it. And it caused, after 15 years, something that I thought would be my retirement money ended up being uh, a losing proposition when I sold it. So it was a difficult legislative decision. Not even legislative, because it's, it's a, a, a rule set forth by two people out of three that are elected by townspeople. So it, it wasn't really something that was um, enacted by the town people just by two of the three members of the Board of Health for the town of Hingham. The money that was raised by putting a 25 cent cigarette tax on, they came up with these vast amount of money and all these Boards of Health put a collective together to um, stop smoking in all the different towns. They were supposed to pretty much be educational programs, but they really went after the restaurants more than anything try and make a statement instead of, I'm sure they did some education, but um, it wasn't, most of it was um, a situation where they, they attacked the public places where people could smoke just to, to try and change an opinion by regulation instead of really enacting a law that would benefit everyone. favor of public health is what Board of Health members are supposed to be. Uh, a lot of the restaurants around here are still non-smoking or decided to go non-smoking, but for everybody around here, it did take a toll. You know, I don't think it was just us. I think it was a lot of other places. You know, you walked in, Tin Alley only had to put a door on, you know, but it affected everybody, I think, on Route 9. Uh, you're going to find you, you just can't conform to the regulations. So, in effect, if they did become law and said, yeah, you would do this or else, they'd, they'd just be putting people out of business. And, and even, okay, if they have to spend $124,000, you know, to make it work, you know, can this business afford to spend $124,000 and, and still, you know, maintain its, uh, you know, its solvency as a, as a business if they have to, you know, shell that kind of money out? The restaurants who do have a, a heavy, a large percentage of, of smoking clientele who are forced to spend the month, a considerable amount of money to ventilate and put a system in, um, which basically the, the feeling is that eventually um, Congress will grow a set of Colleonis and um, someone will do something about it and everyone will be out in the cold anyway. I mean. Uh, I built a business uh, over a number of years, and um, basically how I went out of business. So. It's difficult. You much rather have something you did <laughs> to make it go out than someone just pull the rug out from on you. But it's basically, I'm just a casualty of their war. That's all.
good. They'll make a comment like, oh, good. It's a, it,